Well, thank you, uh, <coughs> Master, for really uh, shedding a light on uh, stress as uh, an outcome of a mental uh, health as opposed to physical health, which we've been talking about more, and also uh, clarifying some of the uh, mediating uh, complicating factors, uh, regardless of the, the similar microenvironment, individual level attributes uh, can also play into differentiating different kind of mental outcomes. Uh, before we uh, open it up to uh, questions, I'd like to maybe call on Professor uh, Guo from, from uh, Fudan University uh, in Shanghai because Professor Cha, in talking about the rapid decline of fertility and rapid aging the population. Uh, I think Shanghai uh, is going through that as well. In fact, the total fertility rate in Shanghai probably had dropped below um, one, uh, even lower than Singapore today. And you wrote an essay on the leading causes of death as a result of modernization, uh, good lifestyle and better eating, but dietary problems. Uh, would you like to comment a little bit from uh, the research you've done, the data that you have looked at uh, in response to what the Singapore example might uh, uh, point to? Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Chairman. Uh, I have not uh, read it to uh, this uh, uh, <coughs> Singapore case, but I uh, want to uh, uh, say something about my essay. It's uh, you mentioned <coughs> about the leading uh, killers, ten, uh, ten, lead, uh, ten leading uh, killers in Shanghai. I uh, focus my uh, research on uh, try to find the uh, association between uh, the leading cause and uh, uh, urbanization. Um, so uh, you you can see the. The conference uh, compendium is uh, on the uh, page uh, 13 to uh, page four, 14. I want to uh, show the, uh, I, I, I provide some uh, statistics about uh, uh, the urbanization in Shanghai and uh, the city de development and also uh, the trend of the uh, leading causes. Uh, I found uh, Actually, uh, uh, the, the leading tens, uh, the, the leading cause is very stable, and uh, <coughs> and, me, um, and also I found that uh, most uh, in most cases, uh, Shanghai is also almost the same as uh, many industrialized nations. Um, the pattern changed from. Uh, communicable diseases into non-communicable uh, non uh, uh, diseases. Um, I, I, I think uh, it's, uh, it's, it's very interesting, but uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure how to, uh, how, 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 how to link this to uh, the policy, uh, policy options, because uh, uh, it's very difficult to um, uh, to. Uh, thank, thank you. I think that, I think you summarized very well in terms yeah. of the the findings. I, I really see similarities there. I'd like to turn turn to uh, Detlef if you have a light to uh, mm -hmm. to illustrate uh, the points that you uh, didn't get to make. I guess earlier today or yesterday. Well, I, I, I thought it might be helpful. I mean, we have been hearing uh, so much yesterday and, and, and today on, you know, uh, how, how do we live in cities? You know, what we call civilization. Uh, you know, density and consequence of density and architecture and, and environment. We are hearing a lot about health and about, you know, biology and, and health and disease and how do we cope with it. And I thought perhaps it might be helpful to try you know, get an overarching idea, how can, how can we combine it and how can we develop a new science. There's a new science and the architects certainly, I would blame them if they are not aware of it. There's a new science and that's the new science of evolution. Everybody has heard, especially our, our friends from the UK, of Darwinian evolution. This was descriptive, fantastic hypotheses, but it's only in the last five years 
that we have the methodology to sequence actually what is down here on the slide, the spiral of evolution, starting 3.5 billion years ago with archibacteria, unicellular organisms, they're actually still alive, it's not, they're not dead. They're still reproducing in some areas in the world. And then uh, from these unicellular organisms to fish and to uh, amphibia and reptiles and then primates and man, took 3.5 billion years and we know the sequence Actually, it's being sequenced every day, especially in China, fast, fast uh, rate. Every model organism is being sequenced. So we understand the molecular biology of evolution. And we know that the patents of, of biology, the patents we live with, are very old. Some of the patents are 3.5 billion years old. The way our cells divide, essentially, and are regulated, are essentially still the same as discovered 3.5 billion years ago in evolution. And the brain works very similar to, you know, parts of the brain of fish and amphibia and reptiles. We think we are extremely advanced, but we are not. We are working on very old patterns. So evolution, that's the consequence, is very, very old. And the more important mechanisms are, the older they are, the better they are conserved. Civilization, urbanization, as we have heard, is extremely fast. And this mismatch is causing diseases of civilization. We are discussing now diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, mental health, and so on. And I think what we have to do is develop a new science, combining very precise science of evolution, getting more and more precise, uh, and the complexity of civilization and all, you know, sociology, socioeconomic, and what combine that. I think this will be the avenue to go, and I hope that uh, this will uh, make other people as enthusiastic as I am and many of my colleagues are. Well, well thank you for adding that insight. Now the floor is truly open. Uh, comments and questions for any of the four panelists or the general issues of the focus of this panel? Yes, Professor uh, Fu from uh, Fudan. Yes, thank you. I'm from Fudan School of Public Health and I have a question to the Professor Chai. And when you look at the, your prevalence of the diabetes in, for example, in the 1998, it, 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 and, and it's the 9%. And in the 2004, it's the 8.2%. Uh, but in the 2010, now increased very fast. It's in the different the six years. Why they change so, so much? Do you think, yes, they thought that you are the food or the physical inactivity. So do you have some the evidence so that, for example, the, in these two durations, it means to have the food the consumption greater change or not? It is. Let's keep your questions and answers brief. Yeah, apart from the um, looking at the prevalence of uh, diabetes, we also have um, uh, in terms of prevalence, for example, of physical activity, dietary habits, and so forth. And uh, it actually does um, um, correlate with the change, uh, of course, given a certain uh, lag period. So yes, the physical activity has decreased over the years, and uh, unhealthy consumption has gone up over the years. Yeah, Professor Rotten. Well, I, I want to thank the panelists for what I thought was a first-rate set of presentations, which I guess are so well integrated because of the organizers, but I see two themes, and perhaps they reflect my own interests, that cut across suicide, lifestyle and obesity, frailty, and stress, and the way they were presented. And they have to do with policy interventions. First, does one target the high-risk areas, according to the analyses that have been made, where these problems are most severe, or to use the extraordinary image of Yep, the bottom of the iceberg, the tip of the iceberg, should one do something to improve the whole, the, 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 the whole way of living in the city and shift that curve to the left? Uh, man, now, I would love to hear the panelists uh, address how, how they would deal with that in relation to the city. Dr. Yip. I think when we do suicide prevention, they always involve three layers of intervention at the primary level, secondary level, and tertiary level. 
Now, usually the territory level only has a small population, but when you'd like to do make any changes, it will be very expensive. For example, when you deal with the mental health patients. Now, for the primary level, it's supposed to be that is the measure which affects the whole population. That is what we mean. We like to change the population. So for the policy making, if I was given one dollar, where should I spend my that dollar? Right. I will spend on the primary care. And I think that would be the one who would have some chance to, to shift the whole population because suicide itself is still a rare, rare event. In order to target them, it is difficult. But if you can manage to enhance the mental health of the whole population, and then there will be a chance then to make the difference. Dr. Wu, would you like to take a, a step of that I, question? I, I agree with, with Paul. I mean, um, it, it always makes sense to benefit the maximum number of people. And to do that, you have to take the, um, uh, the primary care approach. Uh, uh, what, what is striking is that uh, all governments know that, but no government actually does it. <laughs> they all focus on the high risk bit. Mm -hmm. and, and the question is, why is that? OK, a question from Stephen first and then, then Richard. A uh, request for some practical assistance from the last four panellists. Uh, in East London, there is a rapidly growing um, involvement of young Bengali uh, men and girls uh, with addiction to alcohol and drugs. Do we think this is largely to do with a breakdown of family structure, depression, or migration, or something else? What can we do about it? Any of the four panels? Want to take that? Well, be brief. Yeah. My question would be, what do you mean by primary care? My answer would be to, to the question, of what, what can we do? I think we have to go to the basics. And I come back to what I, what I said. Why are people committing suicide? Why are they being stressed? We have, to, we have to ask the question, why? Not how and how can we apply primary care and get, get a denser uh, care system? Why are they uh, depressed? Because evolutionary, if anxiety is a normal phenomenon and is helpful, actually, you have to you run away. In our society, by education and by by density, you cannot run away. If the traffic light is red, then you are killed by a car. Okay, so you are educated the wrong way against the way our evolution would teach us to react. And this is, I think, we go have to go back to basic science and then try to create a new of therapy and not just increasing the number of hospitals and, and primary care doctors. Master, how would you respond to that question? Well, I, I think we need to know much more about, um, um, about the value of the, of the urban stressors. We're talking about the urban environments, about the value of the urban stressors. Um, I think the density stress is, is, is a good example. What, what density might mean in, in Hong Kong might not be true for in, in Berlin, as far as, the, as its stress impact is, is regarded and as, as far as its mental health impact is regarded. So we urgently need to know more about this. And we, we as I said earlier, need, need a sort of metrics to do this. And um, we have some examples, and I think, but we need to put our brains together, the neuroscientists and the urban planners, um, um, and then to, to, draw, to draw the consequences. But no, as far as we do not have the information about when stress starts, in which area of this world and in which city of this world, and where the boundaries are and where, how the, the degrees and the ranges of stress are, um, as lo uh, we, we, we can't do anything uh, um, specific um, about it to, for example, um, prevent um, people with a high risk for, for mental health or uh, mental well, ill thank health or depression. Thank you. Richard. Well, just to follow up uh, your, your comment, I, uh, I mean, the positive side of certain kind of stress is that when we feel anxiety, we're also paying attention. Uh, and uh, complex urban environments are environments that they, I'm not talking about at the psychiatric end of it, but uh, stresses of urban life are also, uh, at, at that end, ways of focusing uh, uh, attention, paying attention, uh, not taking things for granted, and so on. And that's also a natural, I mean, it, uh, 
th that kind of uncertainty is, is also, you, you know, biologically natural to us. The issue I'd raise for you about this for planners is that we're constantly told that we have to remove that kind of anxiety, attention making in the environment. When we make a playground, for instance, we have to make a playground in su such a way that it's entirely safe. Uh, that we reduce, uh, this is in Britain called health and safety regulations, uh, modeled on the notion that people feel best in an environment where they're destimulated, where they don't have to worry about their safety. It contrasts, for instance, the kinds of playgrounds that the great Dutch architect Aldo van Eyck made, which had no fences at the edge of them, which were next to traffic. And he said, this is a good thing. Children should learn to pay attention to the world beyond their pleasure. Now, that's stressful. It has anxiety, but it also has a very positive side to it. So I have to confess that when I listen to you talk about this, I, I worry a little that something which is the genius of cities, which is it makes people out of a certain anxiety, worry, and so on, pay attention to where they are, is diminished. A low stress environment would be a very deadly, dull en environment. Now, I know you're not talking at that end about it, but it impacts on our freedom to create what I think of our living urban spaces. Well, uh, well thank you. Well, well, you for maybe think about uh, the, the, the response. Sharon, maybe that question. Thank you. Um, I suppose a, a comment and a question to a colleague um, talking about obesity and uh, the food system. Uh, a comment really, which was in relation to Victor's question of, uh, is it about the targeted or is it about the universal approach, which I think is very different as to whether it's primary, secondary or tertiary. Because uh, if you think it's a targeted or a, a universal approach, that's a political question. Uh, and there is a movement to think about you in terms of shifting the curve, a move to thinking about proportionate universalism, uh, which I'll come to later. But a, a question, a sort of reflection of the, the your, your work. Um, <coughs> to me, with it, we live within a globalized food system. And some of the images that you showed were uh, the traditional approaches of behavior change trying to get people to put different foods into the mouth and telling them that that's what you should be doing and it's going to be better for your health, which fails, has failed everywhere around the world in and of itself. So it's a question of where is, where is Singapore in terms of thinking from a policy perspective? How is it thinking about the interaction with the food industry and particularly the food processing industry? If you're talking about the obesogenic environment, you're talking about ultra-processed foods, whether it's the soda or you know, the, the sorts of foods that you spoke about. How is Singapore tackling that in the context of uh, foreign direct, much greater foreign direct investment coming into your country, which is all uh, highly salted, highly sugared, high fat foods? What, what are you doing as a country? Because, of course, the uptake of that is always in the cities. That response, uh, Masa, you want to get back, Richard? Yeah. Thanks for your comment, which is extremely important. Um, what, is, what, what I would like to respond is stress is not harmful per se. I would never mean to say something like that. And the response, response to what I showed should never be the creation of a low stress or risk free environment that that wouldn't be the right consequence but stress can be harmful under some conditions and we know we, we need to know more about these specific conditions in the urban environment um, that's that's uh, an important difference Dr. thank you dr Cha. you want to respond to uh, Aaron's yeah, I think um, there's a difference between tackling obesity and, say, tackling uh, lung cancer due to smoking. Um, in smoking, I mean, in lung cancer, you can villainize smoking. Right? In uh, obesity, you cannot villainize eating. Yeah? Um, perhaps you can villainize, say, sugar in soda, excessive sugar, excessive salt. 
Um, so I think the strategy is that you need to work with the industry. Um, the difficulty is, of course, do we have sufficient science, uh, sufficient knowledge to be able to, especially in food sciences, to be able to work with industry. Um, so take, for example, we talk about glycemic index. Um, so in Singapore, um, noodles, for example, is a well-known uh, dish similar to your pasta, for example. Um, how do you decrease the glycemic index of uh, noodles, for example? So, so there have been some work with um, the uh, uh, food industry to come up with uh, different versions of uh, noodle that has lower glycemic index. Um, substituting uh, the types of oil, for example, at the hawker centers and so forth. So again, working with the, the industry um, and, and to come up with the idea that healthy food is good for business. You know, can, can, we, can we move towards that kind of paradigm? Healthy food is good for business. Healthy food is tasty. Thank you. Yes, question from the legislator. Uh, my question is really to, uh, to Paul Yip. If, if I look at his chart of uh, 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 suicide rate there, I wonder whether there is a correlation there with property prices. Um, and property, uh, and uh, in 2003, uh, property prices were at an all-time low, and I see suicide rates at an all-time high in your chart. And I see recently your suicide rates going up again, and, and everybody from Hong Kong is complaining about uh, property prices shooting through the roof. So really this kind of a frustration of people's ability to afford a, a reasonable lifestyle, reasonable being what we are induced to uh, believe is reasonable in the city. Paul. I think if the people commit suicide is usually not from one single causes, right? I think it will be a multiple causes, and I, I, I don't think the st uh, um, the stock uh, the housing price is a good yeah, indicator. The stock prices could be better, but I think what I see, yeah, I think in Hong Kong, I think what we need to do, I think uh, uh, since the historical high it is coming down, it is leveling off now. As I remember in 2008, I think the late, uh, uh, the, the, um, the final quarter of the 2008, we have a financial tsunami, a small financial tsunami in Hong Kong, but the tsunami it actually it stay, it, it is staying, staying there, it doesn't go up. So I think it is very much due to the, uh, I think the contribution from uh, a lot of people who are working very hard in the community, who really to raise okay. awareness of the depression and really engaging this vulnerable group of people. You know. I think there, uh, I don't see any more hands. Uh, I'd like to use the last three mi four minutes or so to have each of the panelists maybe give a one minute summary on what you didn't get to say. I know you packed in a lot of information. I think it will be interesting to hear one more time from the four presenters, if you have things to say. Dr. Wu? You went through uh, I, very quickly what you... Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I have a very broad perspective, but uh, since nobody's plucking for the older sector, I will do so because I think in my presentation I didn't make it clear enough. I don't think we ought to focus on diseases. Um, we always think about aging population diseases. We want to talk about social support, caring, the impact of disease on the person in terms of dependency, uh, whether they can look after themselves. I think we ought to uh, uh, change all our discussion, if we're talking about aging population, into designing environments to cater for this very rapidly increasing uh, population, both from the uh, urban planner, the policies, and health and social policies, I think they ought, ought to work together to deal with that because these people are going to increase dramatically in cities. Thank you. Dr. Cha, you have uh, anything else to add? Dr. Cha, anything from Singapore? Um, I think yeah. we, we have talked about different diseases. Um, what I would like to highlight is perhaps the last point on my slide that perhaps what is needed to handle all this complex issue is some form of integrative modeling and simulation. It is done a lot in other sectors, but not so much in health sectors. Um, how do you bring about different kind of models from epidemiological models, cost effectiveness models, you know, system dynamics models, and bring them all together, including even genomics data? Can I have a virtual population, for example, um, that 
correspond to, say, Singapore in terms of demographics, epidemiological risk factors, as well as even genetic risk factors, and then simulate what would happen. Um, because I think policy makers now have very short, or, or I mean, all the time they have very short attention span, uh, but, but they, they are under pressure to say that, uh, how do I make the decision? Perhaps modeling and simulation is a way to go. Thank you. I'll give the last word to uh, Master. Um, my last word, now that ur urbanity is becoming more the norm for the seven billion people uh, on this world, um, it's high time to, um, for, for, a, for a good exchange between our different sectors. What we know about the health aspects of urban living is old information, it's old data from, from decades back and um, largely collected in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, I don't know how we, want, how we can extrapolate from this information on today's um, urban living. And that's, I think, uh, should be a new territory of joint research. Thank you. I think my last word is to say that we've learned so much from these four experts. Let's give them a one more round of applause and note the questions. Thank you.